So the word biology is actually um, derived from two um, old-fashioned words. One of them is bios, and that means uh, living. And the other word is logia, and that's basically the study of. So if we put bios and logia together, we get biology. So biology is really the study of living things. So it's learning about life. And year six biology, we're going to look at all sorts of life. We're going to look at plants and animals and uh, funguses. And we're going to look at the way that they grow and function and how they do it depending on the environment that they live. So this is biology, and it is the study of life. Now, plants are a really, really interesting example of a living thing. Um, the reason plants are interesting is because plants grow wherever a seed lands. So if that's in good conditions, then, well, lucky for that plant. But if it's in bad conditions, then the plant's going to find it quite difficult, I suppose. So an important thing to do when uh, talking about plants is to look at the structure of a plant. So a plant's actually got made up of uh, quite a few uh, different things. So down at the bottom of a plant, uh, one of the first things you, you, well, one of the things you never see is uh, plants have got roots. So the roots are always in the ground and the job of uh, roots of a plant is basically to get nutrients out of the soil and then send them up, up, up the stem of the plant. So roots is, yeah, get nutrients out of the soil and send it up to the rest of the plant. Uh, obviously then the stem here, so the stem is um, part of the plant and the job of the stem is basically um, it enables the plant to, to grow and be um, higher up and closer to the sunlight. But the, the job of the stem really is to enable both nutrients, um, so plant food and water to flow you know, up and down uh, the plant. Uh, some other uh, important features of a plant is one of the, uh, I would say the most important feature of a plant is the leaf. And the reason that the leaf is, I say the leaf is the most important feature of a plant is because photosynthesis happens in a leaf. So that's a really big word, photosynthesis. Um, but basically what that means is that the leaves of a plant, they are able to take in water, or well, they get water from the ground, but they're able to take in water and carbon dioxide and they turn via a chemical reaction called photosynthesis, they turn the water and the carbon dioxide into oxygen, which is something that we breathe, and they also turn it into food. So they turn the water and the carbon dioxide into, or well, they turn it into plant. They turn it into the stuff that enables them to grow. And of course, uh, lots of living things on earth eat plants. So it is really, really important that um, plants can do that thing called photosynthesis. Um, some other parts of a plant uh, is, is a flower. And a flower is actually um, the reproductive organ of a plant. And so a flower actually enables a plant to make new baby plants. And so it does that by, by having, um, so a, a flower is important, it helps it reproduce, but a flower in fact enables it to have a seed uh, and the seed is, you know, it's like the start of a new plant. Um, and in fact, seeds are often found in fruit and fruit gives uh, new seeds nutrition to start them growing. So the flower um, enables a plant to reproduce and make new plants um, and it does it using a seed and the fruit helps the seed grow. So the flower, the fruit and the seed, that's all, they're all kind of really involved in um, helping a plant to make new plants. So there are all the different parts of a plant. So there's, you know, the roots down the bottom, the stem, uh, leaves, and then a, uh, the seed, the flower, and the fruit. So we've said that um, flowers are the reproductive organ of a plant. And let's have a little bit of a closer look at a flower. So in fact, there's two main parts to a flower. One of them is called the stamen. So this stamen uh, is actually made up of something called a filament. So that's these little thin things down here. And it's on, the filaments have got an anther on the top. And in fact, the stamen is the boy or the male part of the flower. Um, so it's, got, it's where the pollen comes from. Uh, so pollen is to a flower as I suppose sperm is to a human. Now the other part, important part of a flower is the carpal. So the carpal over here um, is made up of a stigma, 
which is this bit on the top in the middle of the flower here. It's also made up of a style, which is this long thing in the middle of the flower. Uh, and it's got an ovary. Uh, and you've actually maybe heard the term ovary before because humans also have an ovary if you're a female. So a female human has an ovary. Um, so in the ovary are the really the eggs of the plant. Uh, they, they're called, we call them ovules. But so what happens is when um, plants reproduce uh, to make new plants, uh, there's some pollen here. There's some pollen here on the top of the anthers. Uh, and often what happens in fact is a, a little bee comes into the flower and it gets some pollen on its back and then it goes off and flies to another flower. Uh, and the bee with the pollen on its back, some of that pollen sprinkles off the bee and it falls or goes down into this stigma, down the style, into the ovary and fertilizes an egg. <clears throat> and then this ovule, uh, in fact, has seeds in it. So they turn into seeds uh, and the ovary turns into fruit. And that's basically how flowers make new flowers. But the important part of it really is that flowers have got a boy part or a male part called the stamen. And they've also got a female part or a girl part called the carpal. And if there weren't flowers, there would be no more plants ever, ever again. And that's about flowers. Now, when we're talking about plants, something really interesting to do is to look at the different types of plants that exist on our planet. And there are different types of plants on, on Earth because over millions and millions of years, plants have evolved different features or different adaptations to enable them to survive in the different environments on Earth. So the reason that's important is because plants have to grow wherever their seed falls. If their seed falls in a place where it's hard to grow and they can't survive there, they'll die. As a result, over those millions of years, plants have adapted these different features. And I'm going to go through three different types of plants. So the first one here is a water lily. Now a water lily um, is a type of hydrophyte. So a hydrophyte is basically a plant that can survive in areas where it's really, really watery. So lots of plants can't survive when it's really, really wet, but water lilies can. And a, an, a, an adaptation that water lilies have to enable them to survive is that they've got these teeny tiny holes in the surface of their leaves called stomata. Now importantly, all leaves have stomata, these teeny tiny holes. And the purpose of those holes is to enable gases like carbon dioxide or oxygen to get into or out of the plant. So normal leaves have these teeny tiny holes on the bottom of the plants because their leaves just float around in the wind. But water lilies, their stomata are on the top of the plant. And basically having the stomata on the top of the plant for a water lily enables the water lily to breathe, to get oxygen and carbon dioxide into and out of its tissue. So that's a fantastic adaptation of water lilies that helps them to survive. Another type of plant I've got here is a plant, well it's a cactus, but a cactus is an example of a group of plants called xerophytes. So xerophytes are plants that can survive where there's hardly any water and not many plants can do that. But xerophytes can and a cactus is a great example of a xerophyte. Now some adaptations or some features that a cactus has to enable it to survive. Uh, the first one is that it doesn't have any true leaves. It's got these highly modified leaves uh, and they're these spikes or spines. Um, the reason it doesn't have true leaves is that leaves are actually a place where uh, normal plants lose lots of water. So lots of water leaves a plant via its leaves via a process called transpiration. So because um, cacti don't really have any true leaves, that enables them to conserve more water. The other thing that uh, cacti have is that they've actually got a kind of waxy coating on their um, surfaces. And again, this waxy coating on the surface of uh, cacti or cactus plants is basically it enables them to conserve water. So because it's waxy, not much water leaves the cactus. And again, it's just another way for them to conserve water, uh, reduce water loss in places where there isn't much water. So a cacti is an example of a xerophyte. 
Now the last type of plant I'm going to uh, go through is a mangrove tree. And a mangrove tree is an example of a halophyte. So a halophyte is basically a plant that can survive in areas where it's really, really salty. And mangrove trees often grow right next to the ocean and the ocean is full of salty water um, and mangrove trees, mangrove trees can survive there. Mangroves are really interesting trees because they've got a couple of different adaptations that enable them to survive um, right next to the ocean. One of those things is that they actually um, get rid of salt. Um, you know, they excrete salt out of their tissue. So there's really salty water um, right near the ocean, but a, halof a halophyte like a mangrove can excrete salt or exclude salt from its tissue uh, <clears throat> at its roots. So you'll of often find patches of salt, you know, around halophytes because they're actively getting rid of salt from their bodies or from their from their tissue. Another really interesting adaptation of a mangrove tree in particular is that, uh, and this um, mangrove picture I've got here is a great example. All of these things here sticking up out of the ground, there's a big one, there's lots of these things sticking up out of the ground. They're actually um, roots. They're the roots of a mangrove tree and they're called aerial roots. They're actually called pneumatophores. So mangrove trees have got these aerial roots that poke up out of the ground. So the tree goes down here and there's all these roots under here, but then all these roots poke up out of the ground from the mangrove tree. <clears throat> and basically this enables the mangrove tree to get gases um, into and out of its body like oxygen and carbon dioxide. So the reason it can't um, get them as efficiently um, from the ground, like lots of plants do, is the ground is full of water. So there's not as much oxygen and carbon dioxide in the ground right next to the ocean as there is in other parts of the world. So to get around this, over millions of years, uh, mangrove trees adapted, or you know, they, they evolved these aerial roots and they enable them to get oxygen and carbon dioxide into and out of their tissue. So mangrove trees have got, you know, a couple of great things. One is these aerial roots that enables them to get gases. Uh, they basically snorkel for air, I suppose. And the other adaptation is that they can actually get rid of salt from their tissue. And that really helps them um, to survive really, really well. So there are some pretty harsh conditions or harsh environments on Earth. Um, there's places where it's really wet, places where it's really dry, um, places that where it's high up, high altitude, low altitude. But in fact, you'll find living things or organisms all over the place. And animals in particular, I find really interesting to look at because they've got some amazing adaptations that enable them to survive where they live. And there's three good examples that I've got here. So the first one is the Australian bilby. Um, it's basically a little mammal and it lives in the desert. Uh, it forages for food and it lives in a burrow. But the most interesting thing about the bilby is that it doesn't even have to drink water. It basically never drinks water. How does it survive? Well, the bilby is in fact able to get all of the water it needs from the food it eats. It uses water so efficiently um, that it doesn't need to drink. And that's a really amazing adaptation that helps the bilby survive um, in the harsh desert conditions of Australia. Another example uh, of an animal which has got an amazing adaptation to enable it to survive is uh, the thorny devil here. So the thorny devil has also got this amazing adaptation which you know, evolved over millions and millions of years to enable it to survive. And that is that it's in fact got these tiny, it's got these spikes all over it, that's why it's called the thorny devil, but it's got these tiny grooves all over its body. And when water either falls on it, on the rare instance that it does in the desert, or more often when water condenses on its body in the morning. Um, so, you know, if you go out in the morning and there's a little bit of um, moisture on the grass, it's called condensation and it's, you know, it's just water from the air. So when condensation or water from the air forms on this thorny devil, it's got these tiny grooves all over its body and all of those grooves run all that water into its mouth. So one of the ways that the thorny devil drinks is basically collecting water on its body. And that helps it to survive in the really dry conditions of the desert. And that's just an amazing animal. Uh, 
The third animal I'll talk about, which has got heaps and heaps of adaptations to enable it to survive, is the camel. So the camel's not actually native to Australia, um, but it was brought over here and it, it has got some amazing adaptations that enable it to survive in the desert. Uh, so I'll go through a couple of them. The first one is that the camel's actually got these beautiful long eyelashes. Um, and the long eyelashes are basically to um, enable it to keep sand out of its eyes in the desert if there's you know a sandstorm. Um, so that's a great thing to enable it to um, survive. Another amazing adaptation of the camel is that it's got a nostril, or it's got nostrils, that it can actually close. So if things are really windy and sandy, it just closes its nostrils so no sand goes up its nose. And that's a, an amazing thing for an animal to be able to do. The biggest adaptation that most people think of when they think of a camel is they think of its hump. Uh, its hump is not full of water, uh, contrary to what some people believe. It's actually full of fat. Uh, so it's just a, a fat store. And basically having a, a storage of fat uh, enables uh, the camel to survive uh, for long periods in the desert, maybe when it's um, not able to find much, um, much food or water. Another thing that the camel has that enables it to survive is um, it's actually got um, some fur here, lots of fur. And what that does is it, uh, it gets really cold in the desert at night, so it makes it um, warm at night but it also ensures that it stays cool during the day. Um, so it's got this amazing fur uh, and underwool coat, which enables it to survive in the desert. And the last thing that um, a camel has to help it to survive is it's got these beautiful lips here, and they're really thick lips, and they enable the camel to chew down on some, um, some pretty tough, thorny um, plants that grow in the desert. So the camel has, in fact, lots of different adaptations that enable it to survive in its environment. So when we think about animals living in extreme environments, Antarctica, where it's minus 40 degrees Celsius and there's 100 km an hour winds, that is an extreme place to survive. But astonishingly, these big birds called emperor penguins, well, they survive in Antarctica. Uh, and they do it because, again, over millions of years, they've evolved to have some special um, adaptations that basically can let them keep living. So the first one is, is basically what, it's, what the penguins are doing right here in this picture. And it is they are huddling. So they form this really big huddle where they're all squished really close together. And this basically enables all the penguins to maintain a reasonably high body temperature so they don't freeze to death. What happens is the penguins on the outside spend a little bit of time on the outside and they often turn their backs to the wind, but they all take turns on the outside and then moving into the inside of the huddle. So if it's, you know, minus 20 degrees outside of the huddle, inside the huddle, it can actually get up to being about 24 degrees Celsius. So it can be, you know, 40 degrees warmer in the huddle than out of the huddle, way warmer. Uh, it's actually a, a, um, a behavior, this adaptation, uh, and it's something that they do as a team. So all of the penguins work together so that they can all survive. So penguins have also got some features that enable them to survive. Um, and a couple of them, are they've got these feathers uh, and the feathers basically trap a layer of warm air close to their body. And again, that, that basically helps them to not freeze to death. And they've also got um, layers of fat um, just underneath their skin. And the layers of fat, again, um, basically help them to retain heat so that they don't freeze to death. Um, so penguins, yeah, they've got some um, interesting, you know, fat and feathers that help them survive. But the most amazing thing, if you ask me, is the way that they huddle together so that they don't die when it gets freezing cold. That's just amazing. So something amazing that uh, anim some animals do to enable them to survive is something called migration. And migration is when uh, animals move a long distance from one place to another. And they do it for lots of different reasons. Sometimes they do it because they need to go to somewhere else to find some food. Uh, sometimes they do it because they need to move to their breeding grounds. Uh, sometimes they do it because of the climate. It's maybe a bit too cold and they need to go some, somewhere where it's warmer. Uh, so two quick examples of migration. Uh, one is, is a, um, an amazing example. Uh, this is salmon. So I've got a couple of salmon here. <clears throat> Basically, the salmon's uh, life is just basically one big migration um, and it's just amazing the way it does it. What happens is a uh, salmon, first of all, it starts off its life 
as a uh, teeny tiny fish at the at the top of a small um, riverbed. So that's a, a picture of a salmon there. <laughs> so the salmon is born at the uh, at the top of a river, uh, where it's you know a small stream really, and it grows up a little bit there. And once it's grown up a little bit at the top of the river, what it does is it swims all the way down this river into the ocean. And when it gets to the ocean, it's a juvenile, so it's still you know it's, it's a pretty young, but it grows up to being an adult uh, in the ocean and it gets to being a reproductive age so it can reproduce. And then when it's done that in the ocean, what it amazingly does then is it turns around, it finds the opening of the river that it, event that it originally came out of when it was young, it swims back up that river to the exact same spot where it was born. Uh, it's pretty hard to swim up the river. So here they are, they're, they're swimming over the river, but they've got to escape bears, they've got to swim over rocks. So it's a really hard journey. Um, and when they get up to the top of the river, they reproduce and they lay some eggs and then some new salmon are born. But the amazing part about it is that at the top of the river, when new salmon are born, the parents, they basically die. So new salmon are born at the top of this river and nobody tells them what to do. They just know somehow in their DNA, in their genes, it's encoded in their genes that tells them this behavior to swim down the river into the ocean and then swim back up to reproduce. And it happens over and over and over again. No one tells them how to do it, but they just know to do these two enormous migrations down the river and then back up the river to enable the species of salmon to keep surviving. It's amazing. The other example of migration is, is birds, and in fact, thousands and thousands of species of birds migrate, uh, and they do it for a host of different reasons, um, because they you know, often want to go to a different climate. But some birds, or birds have got some really interesting adaptations that enable them to survive and also enable them to migrate. So the first one is a behavior that birds do. Um, birds fly in this V formation, and basically a V formation enables the birds to fly and uh, use up less energy when they do fly. So it's really hard to be the bird at the front, flying at the front, um, because you have to use up lots and lots of energy. But if you're a bird at the back, it's nowhere near as hard. And um, the birds take different turns at the front and the back so that they all don't get as tired as they would if they were just to fly by themselves. Birds also eat quite a lot um, before they start their migration um, in case they don't uh, are unable to eat as they fly you know, across the vast expanses of the ocean. Um, and a feature of birds that enables them to fly is in fact that birds have got hollow bones. And the hollow bones makes them light and it makes it easier for them to fly. And you know sometimes they do fly a really, really long way. Um, so that enables them to migrate. So yeah, migration is an amazing animal behavior um, that basically enables a species to survive and salmon uh, and you know various species of birds are great examples of migration. An amazing thing that some animals do to enable them to survive is something called hibernation. So hibernation is basically when an animal slows down its metabolism, it slows down its breathing rate, it slows down its heart rate um, and it goes into a really extended state of rest to enable it to survive um, when maybe the conditions are really, really tough. So we say hibernation is a form of extended torpor because torpor is also when an animal reduces its heart rate, um, reduces its breathing rate and goes to sleep. Um, the difference between hibernation and torpor is that torpor is, is often just for a short period of, period of time, maybe a few days, um, and animals can be woken up when they're in torpor. So it's just like a really, really deep restful sleep. But hibernation can occur for months and months on end. A great example of an animal that um, hibernates is the alpine marmot here. Um, and it in fact hibernates for about nine months of the year. And it does that because it lives in environments where it snows. So when it snows, there's no food around. So the alpine marmot, if it was awake and not hibernating, it wouldn't be able to find food and it would in fact starve to death. So what it does is, for the three months of the year when there's lots of food, it's up and it's active and it eats an enormous amount of food and gets really, really fat. And so it has these stores of fat. Then it goes into hibernation, slows its heart rate down, slows its breathing rate down, um, so it doesn't really use up much energy, but it slowly, slowly uses, uses up those fat stores to enable it to survive the winter. 
Another example of an animal that uh, hibernates is uh, the short-beaked echidna. So this here is a, is a picture of a short-beaked echidna. Uh, so it lives in Australia uh, and it hibernates to enable it to survive. Um, so it, it goes into a state of really intense rest for you know, a long period of time. And it's amazing hibernation. Uh, the um, short-baked echidna is a good example because its body temperature, which is normally at about 32 degrees, drops to only uh, 4 degrees Celsius. So the body temperature drops right down. Uh, its heart rate, which is normally 50 or 60 or 70 beats per minute, drops to about four. Its heart only beats about four or seven times per minute. So it really, really slows down. Um, and it can, in fact, breathe about once every three minutes. So its normal bodily functions really, really slow down enormously. Um, that's called hibernation. And it basically means the animal has to uh, consume less food or no food and it uses hardly any energy, and that enables it to survive uh, for long periods of time when conditions are really tough. So that's hibernation.